Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and since we finished with A.P. Hill's biography last week, I asked my patrons to choose the next Union General to cover, and they chose the Western Theater Union General, John A. McClernand. You may not have heard of him much, aside from the occasional mention of his part in the Battle of Shiloh and the Vicksburg Campaign, but McClernand remains an important figure in Civil War history, not only because of his actions on the battlefield, but also because of his political connections. Dr. John McClernand left his native homeland of Scotland in the late 1700s and found himself in Ireland, where he promptly left, possibly because of the political tumult arising from the Irish Rebellion of 1798. He then proceeded to Philadelphia, staying there a short time before heading west to the Promised Land, talked about in newspapers called Kentucky. While in Kentucky, the physician met a widow named Fatima Seton Cummins. Their first and only child, John Alexander McClernand, was born on May 30, 1812 in Breckenridge County, Kentucky. The child's ancestry could be traced back to the prominent Scotsman during the reign of Malcolm I of Scotland, but now, with no royal or knightly titles in the United States, John would need to cultivate a life of his own in the frontier of the relatively new country. At the age of four, the family moved to Shawnee Town, Illinois. Not long after settling in Illinois, John's father passed away and his resourceful mother took up the slack and provided for herself and her young son. She provided him with a basic education, and by the age of 16, an Illinois state senator took a liking to the young man and taught him French and Latin, as well as provided him with law books to study from. After four years of hard studying, McClernand passed the bar in 1832 at the age of 20. Also in 1832, the Sauk and Fox Native American tribes crossed the Mississippi River to reclaim their lands on the east side of the river, which frightened the communities in Illinois and the territories to the north. The state of Illinois called up the militia to fight what became known as the Black Hawk War, named after the Sauk leader, and McClernand enlisted. In his three-month service, he became the assistant quartermaster on the staff of Brigadier General Alexander Posey. The only great service John saw during his time in the war was when the general recognized him for carrying dispatches from the general hundreds of miles through hostile territory. When the conflict ended, McClernand's health quickly deteriorated, and to combat his ill health, he began an active life working as a trader along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. By 1835, he returned to Shawnee Town, where he established and edited the first Democratic newspaper in town called the Gallatin Democrat. It didn't last long, so McClernand entered politics, fallen in the footsteps of many lawyers. Politically, McClernand was Democrat, and he won a seat in the Illinois legislature in 1836 at the age of 24. Two other prominent politicians began their political careers in that same governing body and shared that legislative session with McClernand. One was future senator and presidential hopeful Stephen A. Douglas, and the other was future president Abraham Lincoln. In a largely bipartisan initiative, Whigs and Democrats worked together to hammer out an internal improvements bill to allocate around $8 million to improve roads and rivers, as well as build railroads, all to boost the economy of the state. Jackson's bank war partially led to the bill's demise that many politicians worked hard to create. McClernand and Lincoln battled back and forth over the existence of the Illinois State Bank. Since McClernand belonged to the Democratic Party, he endorsed the reduction and destruction of central banking practices. After debates in the legislature, Lincoln wrote that McClernand spoke a lot but said very little. But McClernand, through his dedication to the Democratic Party principles, endeared himself to the party. In the 1830s, as a result of the Nat Turner Rebellion and the rise of abolitionism, Southerners began to recall and place restrictions on abolitionists, their societies and pamphlets, fearing that their actions risked the lives of whites all over the country by riling up African Americans, both free and enslaved. Southern states, as well as northern ones, issued proclamations denouncing abolitionism and their tracks. Illinois took up the debate in the legislature, which forced McClernand to confront the issue of slavery. McClernand's views echoed that of the Illinois House, which reported that abolitionist actions threatened the entire country and denounced their actions as volatile and harmful. McClernand and other legislatures emphasized that the federal constitution protected slavery, and as long as the states wanted to keep the institution, they possessed that right. After an eventful one term in the legislature, McClernand decided not to run for a second term. 
His political ally, Thomas Carlin, who ran and won the governorship, offered the office of lieutenant governor to McClernand, but since the Illinois state constitution restricted that office to those 30 years of age or older, McClernand declined. He was only 26. Carlin then appointed him Secretary of State. However, the incumbent Secretary of State, Alexander P. Field, argued that the Illinois Constitution did not give the governor the ability to remove an appointee. McClernand sued, and it went to the Illinois Supreme Court with Abraham Lincoln helping the legal team for Field and Stephen Douglas representing McClernand. The court ruled in favor of Field. Carlin then appointed McClernand to the Illinois and Michigan Canal, and he became its treasurer. As part of the Canal Commission, he held the responsibility, as everyone in that commission did, to not leak information as to the location of the canal to cut down on land speculation. He may have broken his oath to keep the route a secret when he wrote to the director of the Bank of Illinois that land in Lockport, Illinois would double in value, but no clear-cut conspiratorial land speculation could be proven. In 1840, McClernand ran and won election to the Illinois legislature again, and again serving alongside Abraham Lincoln. In this session, McClernand fought against an anti-immigration bill that would disenfranchise unnaturalized aliens residing in Illinois. Immigrants tended to vote Democratic because of their stances on individualism. Whigs tended to want a more homogenized society and saw immigrants as a threat to that. McClernand argued that the bill, supported by the Whigs, violated the Constitution that allowed white males to vote who resided in the state for longer than six months. In his speeches against the bill, he attacked the judicial system of the state and one of the state Supreme Court justices, Theophilus Smith, challenged McClernand to a duel. Both men agreed, and when McClernand showed up at the designated dueling location, the justice never appeared, resulting in McClernand being declared the man with more honor and thus the winner of the duel. In 1840, McClernand campaigned to re-elect Martin Van Buren as president. He journeyed around the state making speeches and on many occasions ran into Abraham Lincoln, who was campaigning for William Henry Harrison. In 1842, the voters of Gallatin County sent McClernand to a third term as a legislator. When the U.S. Senate seats came open from Illinois, he tried in vain to gain one of those seats. One newspaper explained that they believed the reason he could not get the spots was that he was guilty of the sin of residing in the South. That description did not refer to his early life in Kentucky, but to his residency in southern Illinois, which because of its closeness to the slaveholding states of Kentucky, Missouri, made it an area known for its pro-slavery stances. The area became known as Little Egypt because of its slave population. Illinois barred future introduction of slaves into the state when it entered the Union in 1818, but allowed French slaves and indentured servants who had been brought into the territory to remain in those conditions. It was also not uncommon for slave owners in Kentucky to also own land in Illinois and work their slaves in both states, and as long as the slaves did not reside in the state for six months, they were considered in transit and thus not made free. During the 1842-43 legislative session, Illinois debated a bill that would require blacks living or moving through the state to provide proof of freedom or face confinement for one year. Gustav Corner objected to the bill, asserting that it infringed on personal liberties, but McClernand countered his argument by saying if the bill did not get passed, Southern Illinois especially would be overrun by what he called a most dangerous population. The bill died in committee. Though McClernand lived in a free state, he continued to deal with the slavery questions that consumed the entire country. <laughs>